Hello and welcome to episode 30 of the Ortho Valpal podcast. I'm your host, Paul Marquis. And to be totally honest with you, I can't believe this is episode 30 at this point. I just, I've been ecstatic about doing these uh, podcasts. It's been great. Um, when I first started, I wasn't sure how this would go. Um, and my comfort level to doing these podcasts has been getting uh, a little bit better. And um, I, I really love sharing all this content with you. And so uh, ecstatic to be at episode 30. Um, you know, and my goal is to hit uh, 100 episodes at some point. And uh, I've got tons of content coming. So super excited about it. And uh, even have, uh, you know, some guest speakers uh, lined up uh, to come in and talk to us about uh, many different topics. So um, hope you're enjoying all the podcasts and um, we are going to um, continue working this as, uh, as well as we can. So episode 30 today, we're going to be talking about metatarsalgia and Morton's neuroma. Now, I remember the last episode I said, you know, we were doing plantar fasciitis and I was really excited about doing it because it's a topic that I really, really like. Well, Metatarsalgia Morton's neuroma is going to be very difficult to do over a podcast. Um, it's something we see a lot of, and I think it's uh, one of those diagnoses that just goes so untreated and, uh, in my opinion, can be easily treated and we can make people's lives so much easier um, by managing these. And uh, so I'll talk a little bit today about uh, what they are, how to distinguish the difference between the two of them, and uh, how to treat them. So metatarsalgia, what is it? Well, if you take a look at the metatarsals of the foot where they meet the uh, the phalanges, okay, that's where that metatarsal phalangeal joint lies. Now, it's very important when you palpate these that you palpate with some pretty good pressure because they're areas that are quite calloused. So make sure that you individualize each metatarsal head when you palpate them. Um, and you should also palpate on the dorsal aspect of the foot over that metatarsal head to see if there's complete inflammation inside the joint or not. Sometimes there's just tenderness between the joints and there can be a pain uh, where they're either rubbing too much or they're splaying too much. Now, people have always wondered, well, where does metatarsalgia come from? Is it because of, you know, wearing high heeled shoes and uh, tight shoes where the metatarsals are all compressed together? Um, and, and sometimes it can be because you're wearing a shoe that is too loose and your foot is splaying too much. That transverse metatarsal arch from side to side is splaying too much and um, therefore taking up too much pressure. Uh, so one of the ways to identify if somebody has metatarsalgia is to palpate, but make sure that you take out their um, insoles in their shoes and take a look at the insole because oftentimes it will show you where they are putting too much pressure and causing too much trauma to that area. All right. Now, if you look at the bottom of the foot, the areas that you should be bearing most weight would be on the heel, the bottom of the first metatarsal phalangeal joint, and the bottom of the fifth metatarsal, metatarsal phalangeal joint. So, you know, you have a tripod pattern there, and the ligaments between the metatarsals help to hold that transverse metatarsal arch up a little bit to give you some spring. But over time, what happens is that starts to splay, that forefoot starts to splay, and you start to bear more weight through the second, third, and fourth metatarsals. Now, Metatarsalgia is most common um, at the second and third metatarsals. Uh, it can happen at all five of them or, or any one of them individually, but it's typically most common uh, at the second and third metatarsal and sometimes in between the second and third metatarsal. You can develop something called the predislocation syndrome where the plate, the, uh, the plantar plate starts to um, deteriorate and you lose stability of that metatarsal uh, phalangeal joint and it uh, therefore starts to collapse downward. Um, and uh, that is, uh, I would treat that pretty much the same as metatarsalgia uh, if you're treating it conservatively and non-surgically. So um, the you know, when th th this patient will also have, you know, pain when you, when you mobilize the joint, okay, if you, if you flex it or extend it, that will cause some discomfort there. You might even notice a little bit of swelling around the uh, metatarsal uh, region. And um, so that that's, you know, the most common sign. Now, if we're talking about Morton's neuroma, which some people kind of mistake in the two, Morton's neuroma is an inflammation of the interdigital nerves and, and sometimes there's actually a buildup and a basically a neuroma that builds up um, between the metatarsals that cause discomfort. Uh, between the metatarsals, it can cause pain into the toes. It can also cause some paresthesia or tingling into the toes. So 
they can look um, like each other, but uh, the presentation is just a little bit different. One of the things I like to do when I'm assessing uh, metatarsalgia or Morton's neuroma is I like to take my fingers and clasp them together and put it around the patient's forefoot. Basically, one palm is on the first metatarsal, the other palm is on the fifth metatarsal, and I give a little squeeze together. People with metatarsalgia will have a significant amount of discomfort with that, and I'm very gentle when I do this. And people with Morton's neuroma, sometimes you'll feel or, or hear a little click. It'll be kind of like this here. I don't know if you can hear this. Like when you flick your fingernail, okay? So you can hear that little click when you squeeze them together, and that would be the neuroma kind of squeezing out between the metatarsals um, and popping out, and that'll also cause them some discomfort and sometimes some paresthesia into the toes. Morton's neuroma is more common in the third and fourth toes, okay? So, uh, and sometimes the fifth one also. So there's a little distinguishing uh, factor there. Metatarsal pain, more the second and third. Morton's neuroma, more the, the third and fourth, fourth and fifth. Um, okay. And so uh, typically these people, the reason they get it is because they're putting too much pressure on the metatarsals, the second, third, and fourth metatarsals. They're not made to bear that much weight. Um, you typically take their shoe off. You take a look at their insoles, and they're going to be all worn down. Or there's a lot of, or if they have, wear an orthotic, you'll find that the orthotic is really thinned out underneath the metatarsals. Um, and so you have to think about why do they put so much pressure there? Okay, now if you're wearing a high heeled shoe, you can see why they'd be putting too much pressure there because they're driving the foot down into the floor. You're driving the pressure directly into the metatarsal, causing some irritation. But the bigger factor here is a tight calf muscle. Okay, the tighter the calf is, the more pressure you're going to put through your metatarsals. All right, because the Achilles is pulling on the back side of the heel, the plantar fascia is also pulling, and therefore people heal off faster in the mid stance uh, phase of gait and they're not putting all the pressure through the bottom of the foot when they're in mid stance and terminal stance of gait. So really you should only be towing off um, in terminal stance a little bit later. But the more time you spend driving that metatarsal into the ground, um, the more pressure you put there, the more irritation and inflammation you put there. You'll also notice that these people when they walk and they're in the terminal stance phase of gait, you're going to notice a little whip at their heel. And oftentimes you'll see callus formation under the second, third, and fourth metatarsals where they are grinding. Callus is formed by too much pressure, rubbing, and twisting, and that occurs oftentimes because of a tight calf. Um, so I have all of these people stretch. Now, this is important here. You don't want people stretching by hanging off of a step by putting all the pressure on those metatarsals because obviously that's going to cause more irritation and inflammation. So I make sure they're on a slant board so that that foot is completely flat on the board and the pressure is being distributed down more through the heel and you're getting a good calf stretch but not an excessive amount of stretch or pressure in the metatarsals, okay? Um, the other thing I like to do with these folks is I like to make sure they don't put too much pressure on the metatarsals, like walking on a hard surface. These folks have a hard time with things like ceramic tile and hardwood floors. Um, they also, some of these people will have very small fat pads uh, underneath the metatarsals and you'll be able to palpate the, the, the head of the metatarsal really, really easily because there's really no more fat there. It's basically been worn out. Um, so these folks need cushioning. They need, um, you know, like uh, memory foam type shoes. Uh, I like to use uh, pink PPT and plastizote and make just a temporary insole while they're waiting for an orthotic. Um, and that really helps to give them some shock absorption. And the pink plastic is also anti-friction, so it decreases the amount of callusing. Because if you think about it, if a callus starts to build up under the metatarsal, it's just like putting added material underneath that metatarsal. It causes more pressure. Okay, And so shaving those calluses can actually take pressure off the metatarsals and give them relief. The other thing I like to do is reestablish that transverse metatarsal arch. And I usually do it with a custom orthotic. And I put a metatarsal pad under the orthotic, not on top of it, okay? And I make sure to put that met pad not underneath the metatarsal heads, but just behind it so you're distributing all the pressure through the metatarsal shaft and not through the head. 
I also would bow that a little bit um, so that the higher point is in the middle and it's lower on the fifth and first metatarsals. So you develop more of a normal transverse metatarsal arch. And basically you're developing a little cliff for those metatarsals to fall off of it so they don't strike the floor so hard. And that's what I love about doing orthotics on people with metatarsalgia is that um, these people get their orthotics, they put them on and it's immediate relief. Typically they, they walk out feeling tremendous tremendously better than when they walked in. Um, and it's uh, it's really rewarding to do orthotics on those types of people uh, because they get such um, good relief. Now, I also do modalities. I try to heat the calf. I try to improve the mo mobility there with uh, like a manual roller um, and uh, techniques to help uh, optimize the gastroxoleus mobility. That is huge. Um, a night splint can be helpful if they have morning discomfort in their metatarsals. And um, I may also do like iontophoresis over the dorsum of the foot through the metatarsals because um, the dorsum of the foot is not as callous as the plantar surface of the foot. So you can help with that. Some people will require injections um, and or, uh, you know, consults with an orthopedic surgeon or podiatrist. Uh, and sometimes they need to have, uh, you know, removal of that neuroma to give them some relief. These folks can also do well with a rocker bottom shoe. So if it's last resort, they don't want to have surgery, but they're still having trouble. I put them into a rocker bottom shoe. They don't typically put as much pressure through the metatarsal with the rocker bottom shoe or something with a cam on the bottom. So, um, that is my take on metatarsalgia Morton's neuroma. It's something we see quite often, uh, but uh, you know, oftentimes people go on with pain and problems there forever. Um, I really like to try to uh, address the Morton neuroma problem earlier because if they go on too long, they really get bad uh, and then they require surgery. And not always, and, and they, those don't always uh, respond really well to surgery either. So um, those are uh, the the ways I treat Morton's neuroma and metatarsalgia. Please send me any other uh, advice you might have, or any uh, any treatment techniques that you like to use. Uh, I'm sure there are many uh, other ways to uh, to address these problems. I'm just giving you what works from experience, and uh, and uh, that's what I'm uh, going to continue to stick with. Um, so, um, folks, um, please make it a point to. Uh, give us a rating and review on iTunes. I would really appreciate that. I'm going to put some, um, some, some stuff into our show notes today. I'm going to uh, show you a little impression of somebody's foot who uh, stood on, on something that measured how much pressure that they put through their foot, like a force plate. And uh, I'll talk to you about which foot was the, which, which calf was the tightest and you'll really see the difference. Um, and then I'm also going to um, uh, put the link to our YouTube channel and our uh, playlist on the foot and ankle. I have some uh, metatarsalgia uh, uh, videos in there that I think you're going to like. And uh, also, I'm going to be uh, starting to do some one-on-one uh, -on -one mentoring with folks. And uh, if you're interested, make sure you go over to orthoevalpal.com, go to our um, get in touch page, contact me. I'll have a personal conversation with you about uh, how this all works. We're going to be having a mentoring page coming up soon, and uh, you'll be able to uh, get a lot of information from that page. So again, thank you so much for listening. Really appreciate your time, and I hope you're enjoying the podcast. Take care.